Our scripture passage this morning comes from the 28th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew, verses 16 through 20. Listen, hear, and receive God's word. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. That pericope pericope of scripture is known throughout all of Christianity as the Great Commission. These are the final instructions recorded in the Gospel of Matthew spoken by the risen Christ to his disciples as they stood on a mountaintop in Galilee. Now typically this passage is assigned to Trinity Sunday because it contains the name of, names of the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. However, Spirit led me to this passage today, this World Communion Sunday, and I think that it is a fitting passage for us to begin the EOPC Mission Month. Jesus' instructions in this passage were for his disciples to go. To go and spread the good news of the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Tragically, for centuries, this and other biblical passages were used to justify colonization, to justify the destruction of indigenous cultures, religious practices, and people throughout the world. Scripture has been used to justify manifest destiny, the belief that the expansion of the United States throughout the world was not only justified, but it was also inevitable and honorable. Some of the most egregious attempts to spread the gospel can be summed up in a quote by Captain Henry Pratt, founder of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Kill the Indian and save the man. And unfortunately, you can insert any other indigenous group in that sentence. And for so many and for so long, this has been true. For centuries, missionaries set out to lands far and wide with the goal of spreading the gospel and making disciples when in reality, according to Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove, the Assistant Director for Partnerships and Fellowships at Yale Center for Public Theology and Public Policy. Missionaries were squelching the good news, both for those who proclaim it and those who hear it, end of quote. In other words, more harm was done than good by well-intentioned disciples and followers of Christ, not only to others, but also to themselves. Jesus instructed his disciples to go make disciples, to submerse, surround, and overwhelm them with the gospel good news, to teach, expound upon, or explain everything to them that Jesus had taught them. Now, in my reading and translation of Jesus' instructions to the disciples and to us, we are called to go into the world to embody and be and live the gospel to be examples of Jesus and how he walked among people who others deemed as unworthy, to be in relationship with people, with people whom others marginalized and ostracized, to teach that in the economy of God, those who perceive or that society defines as first, the finest or the most prominent, shall be last, and those whom society considers as expendable without value, value or disposable they shall be first. Mission is about being in relationship with people, meeting people where they are and walking with them, be they in our front or our backyard, around the corner or across the world. 
Mission is best exemplified when we venture out as commanded by Jesus to see and recognize that the Spirit of God is already there and working. You see, we're called to enter into the work of God. Mission is most effective when it is exemplified in the way we live and be and how we move in the world as loving, supporting, encouraging, helping, and allowing others to define how they wish to be in relationship with us or not. We are not called to force our values, our way of living, or our culture on anyone. Let's face it. More harm has been done to others in the name of Jesus than not. We have harmed others when we seek to define how they should live, who they should be or who they should love, or how they should worship God, even if it is the God of their own understanding. And by the way, who are we to say that their God and our God are not one in the same? Susan and Doug read a little bit earlier from 2 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, where Paul instructs, examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus is in you? Beloved, this is a good time for us to examine ourselves, our motives, our actions, our words, our commitments to being the people of God in the world and in this congregation. Amen? Amen. This is a good, as good a time as any to have a come-to-Jesus conversation with ourselves and determine whether we are spreading the good news of the gospel or spending our time engaging in idle conversations that are not productive, that are not loving, kind, or life-giving. And this is a good time to determine whether we are building up the body of Christ and compelling others to want to be associated with the God we worship and serve. Now, I recognize that there are times when we may feel inadequate, unequipped, or unsure about how to engage others or how to spread the good news as Jesus instructed. Verse 17 of the Matthew pericope reads, When they saw Jesus, they worshiped him but some doubt it. I lift this verse up because it is important to acknowledge that we do not always have it together. Okay, I do not always have it together. In life and especially when it concerns faith and trust in God, living as a people who have been claimed and saved by Jesus' sacrifice of dying on the cross and being raised by God from the dead. And I will be the first to admit that faith without doubt is a weak faith. You see, our faith should be such that it leaves room for doubt so that we can work through that doubt and our faith is lifted and, 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 and it becomes stronger than a faith that just goes along to be along. Amen? Amen. By humbling admitting that we do not always have it all together, doubt does and it will creep in. You see, we're not always kind, loving, or compassionate. And admitting that we need to lean and depend on God, then and only then are we on our way to being spiritually healthy, whole, and mature. None of us have reached perfection in our personal, corporate, or missional lives. We are all striving to be God's people and we fall short. Nevertheless, the risen Christ has commissioned us to go and make disciples by being and embodying the good news of the gospel as faithfully as we possibly can. And when we fail and fall short, remembering that the risen Christ is with us even to the end of the age, that is our common mission, to go and to be with the people of God. Imperfect, but being perfected. Unfaithful, but serving a faithful God. Afraid, but accompanied by our Savior, who promised to never leave nor forsake us. 
As we meet at table in a few moments, let us do so remembering that God is with us and that we are members of a great cloud of witnesses, those who have gone before and others who are gathered this day throughout the world, partaking of the bread and the cup that reminds us that we are not alone. We are not alone. If you will allow me, I'd like to close this sermon with a poem titled The Commissioned, written by Andrew King. It's a little lengthy, but hang, hang in there with me, if you will. At first, it feels like a circle closed, a journey completed. This reminder of the mountain where Peter, James, and John saw the Lord transfigured. Speaking with Elijah and Moses, the voice that thundered from the enclosing cloud, filling the disciples with fear. It is Christ himself who speaks to us here, the Lord crucified and now resurrected, proclaiming his authority, and for a moment the apostles might be tempted to think the mission surely is accomplished. Goal achieved. God reigning through Christ and perhaps the eleven look around the peak to see if Moses and Elijah will again appear for congratulatory claps of the hand. But the circle has not closed. The journey has not finished. It is an open-ended, as it is as open-ended as the arching sky and as the road below that leads to the distant horizon. Open as the mission that here Christ gives us, as the promise he makes to be always with us from now to the end of days. For you see, disciples must be made in and from every nation, taught Christ's ways and words, and sent anew to serve men and women of the earth. See how the slanting sun moving across these Galilean hills takes its seat on the rim of the wider world, inviting our eyes to seek not the shades of the prophet's past, but the shimmer of the new world to come. See how, as we lift our heads in the gaze that follows Christ lifting from the earth, we discover no mystifying cloud, nor faces from only scriptural glory. Rather, see the shapes of the yet-to-be appearing in the echoes of his words. There we see Paul in conversation with Peter. And there is Barnabas and Phoebe and Lydia speaking with Thomas, who will travel to India. We can see Boniface and Patrick at Columba standing beside Francis and John and Charles. A little further over, Dorothy Ripley, who labored for slaves in America. Mary Schlesler, who served so faithfully in Nigeria. Elizabeth Fry, who did her work close to home. Just a few among hosts of other men and women come to the summit, hearts receiving Christ's commission for them, whose long shadows shine but in whose shadows, look, over there, right over here, stands another familiar figure who, like them, will be helping to reshape the world that so needs our obedience to Christ's love. Yes, look, over there, it's you and you. In you, commissioned to go out into the world. May it be so. May it be so. Amen.